Hey, what's up ladies and gentlemen? My name is Keith Jacobs and I'm the Illinois 4-H Sim Specialist here at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And today we are going to be making Mandalorian art. Throughout this video, we're going to guide you step by step on how we made our own Mandalorian armor from scratch and how you can do the same thing. If you like what you see here today, be sure to subscribe to our videos and check out more cool content related to not just cosplay, but all things sim related. Thanks a lot, check out this video, and let's get started. For this project, you're going to need safety glasses, expanded PVC foam, EVA foam, as well as some type of leather fabric, 3D printing filament, some assorted clothes and fabrics some safety gloves, different color spray paints, classy dip, can paints, writ dye, super glue, contact cement, as well as scissors, a heat gun, and assorted sandpapers from 80 grit all the way up to 600 grit if possible. Also wood putty, aluminum foil, and plastic wrap. So starting out, what I decided to do was just draw out the Mandalorian armor pieces. This is a great step in anything that you're doing so that you can visualize what you need to do and just have a, a good representation on paper before you get to, to building things that may be unnecessary in the future. So for this armor, the first thing I started with were the undergarments, so the clothes and whatnot that I'd be wearing underneath the armor. So I have an undershirt, which is a long black shirt. I'm going to be making like a vest and an undervest type of piece. Um, I'll be having black jeans as well as workout gloves that I just uh, scrapped from around the house, as well as my black or excuse me, brown boots that I don't have any use for anymore. Next, I went to the actual armor pieces. These are the things that I'm going to be making out of the expanded PVC as well as the EVA foam. I'm going to be building them, cutting them out, painting them, making them look all nice and, uh, and Mandalorian-esque, and make sure that everything is, is good to go based on these drawings specifically. So for this, what I have is a chest piece. I have my left and right cowls for my shoulders. I have my forearm uh, armor as well as thigh armor. I have hand protectors as well as two different um, thigh protectors or pieces of armor. I have a knee piece of armor that I'm going to make as well as a shin like guard protector piece that I'll be fabricating as well. Moving along, I started to get into the accessories for the costume. So these are the things that I'll be also fabricating or making from scrap stuff that I have around the house as well as 3D printed parts. So all these different things are, uh, are things that I, I decided to not necessarily just go for the exact look, but kind of more so the feel to make sure that everything just kind of feels more like the costume. You're not going to be able to get everything exact because you may not have the parts or you may not have time to make it. But, uh, but most things you'll be able to get that feel, which is really important. So we have the belt and the accessories on the belt. Um, these things are going to be 3D printed, including that buckle there. We have a uh, 3D printed um, blaster as well as a holster that we'll be making, as well as some accessories that we just saw and uh, decided to add to the costume. Again, we didn't get all the accessories in there, but we just wanted it to really feel like something. And then the last thing, of course, is that helmet that is going to be 3D printed and polished down and painted, which makes it look super awesome. So let's get into it. This is really, really uh, the part where we get to see what it looks like and make it happen. Now that we got our image drawn, what we're going to do is decide which pieces we're going to either 3D print on one of our 3D printers using PLA plastic, or which ones we're going to fabricate either using the, uh, the EVA foam, which is a soft foam, or the expanded PVC, which is a more rigid, thin uh, plastic. All right, so let's get started with the 3D pieces, and we'll start off by going to thingiverse.com, which is my favorite site to get different uh, 3D models, either in STL or OBJ files, that you can 3D print on your printer at home. Uh, it's a repository of anything you want, so like you saw, the first thing I did was look up Mandalorian helmet. So I needed a Mandalorian helmet, I needed something that would fit on my 3D printer. I went ahead and looked at the files, checked them out, saw that everything would fit right there on my Rostock Max 3D printer. It's a pretty big um, Delta style 3D printer. I went ahead and downloaded those files, opened them up and was able to view them. So the next step in any 3D part or 3D uh, print rather is to 
model it up and insert it into a slicer program. So the slicer that I'm using is Matter Control for my 3D printer. What the slicer does is tells the 3D printer exactly what to do and the steps to take to make the print happen. I went ahead and followed the same procedure for each of the additional accessories that I'd be using, including some of the belt pieces, um, some of the buckles, the blaster, and uh, and just really tried to get everything down to the specifications and sizes that I needed. Again, you download it, slice it, and 3D print it. One of the best feelings in the world is walking into your office after a long night of printing to find your prop blaster completely done, ready to go. Let's see, can we get this in focus? There we go. Look at the detail on this guy. It's incredible. And this is all because Eric yesterday decided to print out the blaster. It was a 15 hour print and it probably took a little bit less than that, maybe 13 or 14 hours, but we got it. Awesome! One of the problems that you'll experience with 3D printing are failed prints. So you'll get plastic all over the place. Uh, sometimes you'll get overhangs that are caused by a 3D printer just printing in open space with no support or anything like you see here. But all those things can be cleaned up. This part of the base down here is offset from the whole body. So at some point during this print, this whole thing like moved all the way to the right so it went from there to over here and continued printing so how do i know that from the back here so this support material down here is all stringy and spaghetti like it's because the whole thing moved on the platform accidentally and shifted but luckily because the whole bottom part of the blaster is support material it really didn't affect the print. Everything else in the print is super steady and ready to go. Great job, Eric. To clean my parts, I use whatever tools I have available, my hands, pliers, a screwdriver, just anything that will allow me to get the extra support material or plastic off to a point where I could sand it down. All right, once we got our parts printed out and cleaned up, we decided to glue everything together. So the first thing you see us doing is sanding down the pieces that we need to glue together. What this does is allows us to create a surface that is rough and allows the glue that we're using, which is a clear Gorilla Glue um, or a super glue that adheres to plastic to really stick to that plastic and hold those pieces together. You see Eric there put a clip on there, just a little binder clip to keep those pieces together and uh, hold them in place. We did the same for both sides and just made sure that the glue was evenly distributed and everything was clamped down. Next what we decided to do after 24 hours is come back and make sure those clips were, uh, were, were holding on steady, those little ear pieces, and glue the top piece down onto the, the helmet. So for this, what we did was the same process, uh, sanding down the edges. And what I decided to do for this is glue the top and bottom pieces together by applying glue on both the top and the bottom and then sticking them down in place. I needed something to make sure that the helmet kept its form because as you see, the front part kind of clasps in. So I used uh, originally just a little dry erase marker, but then I had to find something a little bigger to keep that space open. I allowed this to dry for about 24 hours as well. Here you see the final product, which came out pretty nice. After making sure your part is glued together and all sturdy, what you're gonna wanna do is sand it down. So I started with the 80 grit sandpaper. So rule of thumb, the higher the grit, the smoother the sandpaper is and the more polished the surface you'll get. So this 80 grit really just helps to get the layer lines down and create a smooth part that we can then go and polish down and paint. So basically right now what we have is the helmet sanded down for the first time. If you look real close, you'll see that there aren't very many striations on it anymore. Uh, that's compared to like, say the inside. You get that where you kind of see some of those lines. You don't see that as much anymore on the outside. A lot of these little parts in here, uh, let's see. 
where we have there we go we have some of these lines and it's still kind of shiny I'm gonna really get in there with the sandpaper and uh, and really sand it all down you still see some of the striations but in these corners over here on the sides and whatnot we're gonna fill some of those in because those are divots those divots will make it look kind of bad but it's easy to see divots on this model right now as it's sanded because they'll show up shiny. So you'll see in some of those little areas there, some of those low spots, will be shiny. A few little things, one thing to watch out for when sanding, uh, it generates heat. So you get some of these little divots sometimes. Uh, they're almost like fingerprints marks, really small, but definitely noticeable. And uh, I wanna get those out in the final final sand so there you go to take care of these spots what I decided to do is use a basic wood filler what that will allow me to do is just fill in all the spots evenly and then sand it all down so you get an even smooth coat at the end ready for priming and painting all right so for this in particular we're gonna actually uh, take this whole thing outside so we can sand this guy and uh, not have to deal with any of the fumes or any of the uh, dust particles or anything like that that's kicked up. And that stuff is pretty harmful to you. Just wanna make sure that we're safe. So for this, I went ahead and protected myself. I know the wood filler is gonna kick up a ton of dust. I used a 120 grit sandpaper, which is a little bit smoother than the 80. And just like I did before, I went ahead and applied the sandpaper in a circular motion. Don't press real hard, just kind of let the sandpaper do its thing. That's what it's there for. All right, now that we've got our helmet nice and sanded, what we're gonna do is basically fill it with this primer. So this is a black matte primer. It's gonna allow us to see what uh, divots and whatnot we have in the helmet and really let us get a, a sense of how well we sand it. Uh, once we get this done, we'll go back and re-sand it um, and fill in any spots that we see that may need uh, fixing. If they're not too bad, we might just leave them. Um, but yeah, that's what we'll do. Let's do it. So spraying, I like to stay about a foot to a foot and a half away from my uh, piece that I'm spraying and I like to apply really light layers. As you see it's not fully getting covered, you still see some, some patches of white, but don't go back and over spray those parts because you'll start getting drips. You're just going to want to want to kind of go in and spray it really lightly, make sure you cover as much as you can, um, but just one layer and then come back and do multiple layers slowly and steadily. So after doing the first coat on this helmet, what we're gonna do is apply a second coat. We may fill in some of the little spots that we didn't get, but uh, after we apply that second coat, what we're gonna do is go back, sand it down, and really get, get to, to, to work. Like I mentioned, the primer really will help you see where your holes are. So after applying the primer, you go ahead and sand it down and what you're able to get is a mirror finish. So to sand it down, I went all the way from the 120 and progressively up to a 600 grit sandpaper. I could have went higher, but this is what we were able to accomplish with that 600 grit sandpaper, something that was smooth and shiny. So let's check out some of our interns. That's Eric. Yep. That's Yep. Lacey's over there hiding. I was so confused. <laughs> yes. Now we just need agent. 
So the last thing I went ahead and did after sanding it, priming it, and sanding it down to a almost mirror finish was went ahead and applied a silver metallic spray paint. Again, going real light, uh, multiple layers, and we were able to get a really, really nice glossy finish. I decided not to go with a clear coat or something after that because I didn't want to dull the metallic, um, but just kind of went ahead and just left it rustic and it came out looking pretty nice. So after our helmet was nice and shiny, we went ahead and started to fabricate the tinted visor which we'll be making out of PETG plastic or, wait for it, polyethylene terephthalate glycol modified plastic. It's commonly used in food storage containers and plastic bottles and whatnot. What we did was trace a piece of paper on the inside of the helmet and then went ahead and transferred that tracing directly to the PETG plastic. What this allowed us to do was cut it out and then go ahead and start to mold it and shape it in the shape that we needed for the helmet. To do this, what we used was a heat gun. Heat gun gives it a, a, a soft feel and allows us to kind of form it directly to, to what we needed to do. Then we decided to use some RIT dye to dye this whole thing together. So we boiled some water, put it on the stove, and as you see, RIT dye is used for cotton, wool, nylon, and more. <laughs> Um, however, it is not really recommended for things like plastics. So as you see right there, not recommended for synthetic fibers. So when we went ahead and did this next step of trying to dip it and dye it, it did not work. So I had to go back to the store, buy the writ for synthetic fibers, and redo this process, which ended up coming out pretty decently. The next step was to glue the visor into the helmet, so I used the Gorilla Glue again, the clear glue, that allowed us to just kind of put it there in place and, uh, and really kept a good hold. From dyeing it, you see that you get these little spots, but make sure not to hold it into the water too long, just give it a good uh, dunk, check it out, see how it looks, and even though it's real spotty on the inside, from this picture here, you see that it's really shiny dark on the outside, you can't see anything on the inside once you have the helmet on, and it's good to go. Hey, what's up? So today what we're going to do is we are going to make the armor for the Mandalorian costume. Uh, the way that we're going to do that is actually by making templates that we will design ourselves based on images from that we've seen online from the costume. And we will do that by using aluminum foil, or excuse me, not aluminum foil, saran wrap duct tape and a sharpie. We'll basically wrap my body around with this saran wrap and then duct tape it which will allow it to stick to the saran wrap and not to me and then draw the actual template out on the duct tape. What that's going to allow us to do then is to cut it out, lay it flat and then make templates that we'll then use to transfer to foam and then cut our costume parts out. So let's get started. Alright, so this part took a little while and a little coordinating, but we were able to get it together if we used me kind of like a, like a spindle, in a sense, and had Natalie just kind of wrap my body with the ceram wrap. Um, it worked out pretty decently, and we were able to just go ahead and start applying the duct tape in a very similar fashion. So one thing that I would definitely say is that during this process, make sure not to make it too tight on yourself. Allow some room to breathe because it was a little tight on myself, but it worked out. Okay, cool. Do. Yes. Okay. After drawing the template onto the chest piece in a mirror, based on the drawings that we drew earlier in our sketches, we decided to cut it off. Natalie just went ahead and trimmed it down the back, and it came out pretty nice. A similar process was applied for our armor pieces. So using the sketch from the beginning of this tutorial, we were able to draw out each of the armor pieces, so the ones that go on my thigh, just using a, a general idea of what the shape was. This later on would uh, come in handy because we're gonna be transferring these to a template, a paper template, that we then use to transfer to our phone. After getting the template together, we just cut it out and then decided to trim it up a little bit and lay it flat so we could see how big it was. 
After cutting out each of the saran wrap and duct tape templates, what we decided to do was transfer it onto poster paper. What this will allow us to do is kind of modify the designs and the sketches if we needed to, and cut out precise templates that we'd use to transfer to the EVA or the expanded PVC. One thing I would recommend highly is to draw your templates on one side of the paper, fold it in half down the middle, and then cut it out, which would give you precise templates for both your left and right sides. Next, Eric took those templates and transferred them to our expanded PVC foam. So the ones that we, or rather the pieces that we wanted to create in the expanded PVC, which would be a little bit more rigid, he was able to transfer them precisely and then cut them out using a, a X-Acto knife or a razor. A tip is to score each of the sections that you wanna actually cut off one at a time. What this allows you to do is to slowly and gradually cut through your material without it ripping or tearing. Be sure to take several passes before cutting all the way through it. Next, what you see Eric doing is forming the actual expanded PVC just using a heat gun. Heats up pretty uh, slowly so you're able to, to kind of form it and morph it to what you want it to be. Using a similar technique, I took the EVA foam and cut out the templates for the armbands as well as one of the shoulder cowls. Similarly, I formed them using the heat gun. Oh, there you go. <laughs> At the end, because this was a slightly larger piece, I wanted to make sure that I made it in three different sections. So I went ahead and glued those together using the Gorilla Glue. Next, using basic binder paper, I designed the armband decorative pieces, just kind of looking at the sketch and thinking about how I'd stack them on top of each other. Basically, I designed the templates and cut them out in craft foam and then stacked them on top of each other, which ended up being pretty quick and easy to do. Then after forming some of the pieces, I noticed huge gaps, which I decided to fill in using a quick seal, which is a, a putty substance that you can kind of just smear into place and just allow to set. You can clean it up with sandpaper if you like, but because I wanted this cow to be a little rugged, it didn't really matter too much to me. After allowing it to dry, I coated everything that I made out of the EVA foam in Plasti Dip, which allowed it to, to kind of cure a little plasticky and gave it a little rigidity. And just like with everything else, we spray painted it. Be sure to go over each piece really lightly and build up layers to achieve the best results. Don't be afraid to experiment with different colors and techniques to give your pieces the best aesthetic look. It's really up to you. Some pieces needed a border. So one thing that I did was took some of the craft foam, cut it out around the piece, and then sprayed the entire piece at the same time. Came out pretty nice. After making all of the armor pieces, the last thing to do was to fabricate each of the pieces that would go underneath the armor and the clothing, including the cape that you see Eric cutting out here out of a pretty cheap piece of fabric that we picked up from the fabric store for around five bucks. So as we noticed from our sketch, the Mandalorian armor has a underpiece, which is like a shirt that goes over the long sleeve shirt that goes under the entire body of the armor. 
to achieve this, we sewed on the pants legs of black jeans directly onto the sleeves of that black shirt. As you see, it came out pretty nice. The last thing to do was to fabricate each of the accessories for the Mandalorian armor. So this included the belt, the uh, little buckles, um, some of the other things that we, we noted in our sketch. To do this, I took a bunch of different pieces that I had laying around some scrap pieces. I made a pocket as you see me doing here just from a template as I did with each of the other pieces. And uh, for the most part, just kind of put things together. I'm not necessarily trying to achieve the exact uh, look, but rather the feel of the of the costume based on different sketches and pictures that we've seen. For me, this was one of the best parts of the design process because it allowed me to kind of freestyle and just come up with things as I went. All right, so what you see here are the final pieces ready to go, fully painted, lined up with the with the undergarments. But what we really wanted to do was give each piece a weathered look. So with this piece of EVA here, the, the shoulder cow, you see I just picked out some of the pieces with my hands. It just looked real battle hardened. Then what we did was paint in each of those little spots and holes with a silver metallic acrylic paint. Uh, just hand painted, it just made it look real shiny. We did the same thing with each of the expanded PVC pieces, except for these here where you see it's just kind of scraped off and dull. All in all, each of the pieces came out looking really, really nice. And without further ado, this is the Illinois 4-H STEM team's version of the Mandalorian armor. Even though owning a full suit of Mandalorian armor is pretty awesome, it's not something that's practical and that I'll be wearing on a regular, even semi-regular basis. So what I decided to do was transform my costume into a piece of art, a statue of sorts. So what I decided to do first was make a sign that will go on a post that I'll post all of the Mandalorian armor onto and just kind of be creative with it. Don't really know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to freestyle it. As you see, I went into Adobe Illustrator and just started experimenting with different fonts and different design. I wanted something that was, uh, was kind of cool and had a Mandalorian theme with it. What I came up with was Mando's Not Welcome. I went ahead and add the slash marks and used some images that I found online to just give it an awesome feel. Like I said, it's not necessarily about the exact look, but more so the feel. Glowforge uses a carbon dioxide laser that allows us to etch or cut almost any material that we can fit into the Glowforge. In this case, we're etching and cutting directly onto a plank of wood. As you see here, the Glowforge uses a fine laser to go through one line at a time and etch or cut your design. Because I had 50 minutes or so until the print was done, I decided to go outside and just start composing this art project. I didn't really have any ideas hard and steady, I just kind of went with the flow of things.
Once I saw that my laser cut was complete, I went inside, grabbed it, and mounted it directly onto my piece of art. And I'm proud to say this was a finished product. left the clips I'll have to say that this project came out pretty nice especially having come from a cosplay costume all the way down to a piece of art I can display in my office or at my home not bad Keith here. If you guys like what you saw today, be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. If you want to see more of this type of content, as well as information on how to make 3D printed parts or finished parts, as well as fabricating different parts of costumes and cosplay information, be sure to check out our YouTube page, as well as our Twitter and Instagram feed. We'll be sending more information down the pipeline regarding a potential cosplay contest this summer, and be awesome to see you there. Thanks again, this is Keith Jacobs. Like and subscribe, and thanks for watching Illinois 4-H STEM with the Illinois 4-H STEM team.